Hello, lovely internet strangers. So this is a follow-up to my book review on Woman in the New Race, where I'll be sharing a few things that didn't quite fit into that video talking about her main arguments, but were interesting nonetheless. And I will discuss them in no particular order. An interesting point that Sanger makes in the context of the modern feminist wars is that women are too likely to try to think and solve problems like men do, so that if women get power in government or industry, art, morals, religion, and they accept the conditions that are there, they will be following men. So women should trust that men will take care of men. And the implication is that women should take care of women. She says, quote, her mission is not to enhance the masculine spirit, but to express the feminine. Hers is not to preserve a man-made world, but to create a human world by the infusion of the feminine element into all its activities. She also says, quote, woman must not accept, she must challenge. Her eyes must be less upon what is and more clearly upon what should be. She must act from her intuition. Only thus can she remake the world. And further, quote, the world is indeed hers to remake as it is hers to build and to recreate. So in the modern era, she would be the kind of woman who talks about women who are secret agents for the patriarchy, so to speak. That if women can get power, but then they only act in men's interests and not in the interests of women, but they're doing things in a masculine way versus a feminine way. Because that is one of the many schisms within feminist thinking. Are you chasing the masculine or are you chasing the feminine? Because there are the feminists who are supportive of men and women's differences and think that essentially women's way is better. You know, women's intuition, women's way of thinking, that workplaces need to change to accommodate the ways that women think and be more collaborative and have more of a work-life balance and all of these things. And then there are the feminists who are more chasing the masculine, who act in masculine ways. Although they would reject the idea that those ways are masculine because men and women are the same. We're all human. And then there are women like me who, you know, have left feminism, but will just say that some women are more masculine, some women are more feminine, and people in general should be allowed to and encouraged to pursue what will make them happy. And I don't mean happy in any particular moment, but to pursue, as Peterson would say, what is meaningful, not what is expedient. I believe that women who will thrive in STEM roles and more masculine workplaces should go there, and women who seek a more collaborative environment with paid family leave should start those companies and provide those environments. That would require personal responsibility for women to decide that they are responsible for making the change they want to see in the world, and I just don't see that happening in the current feminist movement. I just see a total lack of personal responsibility. Sanger actually agrees with me on the personal responsibility of women over their pregnancies. She says that no matter what solution is proposed, that a woman is in the same position until she can decide when or if to be a mother and the number of children to have, and so this makes birth control a woman's problem. She answers the question of what is a man's responsibility by saying that in an ideal society, yes, birth control would be the concern of men as well, but like modern feminists, she says that men have currently refused responsibility and have tried to prevent women from having knowledge of birth control. Now, in current year, it's not so much that feminists will claim men prevent women from having knowledge of birth control, it's more they will claim that men will prevent women from having access to birth control. Like when Donald Trump came into office and feminists were telling everyone to go get an IUD because he was going to make them illegal, which was insane. Both telling people to run out and get an IUD just out of the blue without considering the long-term effects, and that he was going to make IUDs illegal. So she says that men have not taken responsibility for it, and leaving birth control to men would lead to enslavement to men's desires. Like modern feminists, she says that men will not consider women apart from his needs, that in the bedroom men only care about themselves and not the woman's pleasure. Now, Sanger would not have been on board with a feminist movement like in the modern era that is very much like, well, have kids if you want to or not. Women not having children would have been something she would have seen as a rare occurrence. Now, she might have been okay with the trend of less children because she sort of addresses the race suicide argument that you see a lot of people on the further right talk about today, you know, that the white race is having less children, so they're being outbred by these other races, or that it's bad that overall educated and more affluent people aren't having children as frequently as they were before, and that when they do, they have less children as compared to people of working and lower classes. Sanger would have been okay with the upper classes having less children, but she also would have wanted the lower classes to have less children in general. As I said in my previous video, she was a Malthusian thinker, so she was worried about overpopulation. Some important historical context about birth control is that at that time, it was really only being advocated for married women. You can actually see this depicted in the TV show Mad Men, which takes place in the 60s, when birth control methods were more widespread than when Sanger's book was written in 1920 and more technologically advanced, but there was still a stigma, as there was in 1920, about birth control for single women. The character of Peggy, who's a young single woman, goes to get birth control pills from this doctor that her single co-worker recommended, and the doctor kind of gives her like a, don't just use these as an excuse to go sleeping around spiel. Sanger talks about this clinic that she opened that was shut down pretty quickly, but the 
women who came were all married women. So mostly she was trying to help women who were married and going to have kids or already had children and who loved those children and wanted to make sure those children had a high quality of life and did not want to have additional children that would become just more mouths to feed. So birth control as it is today, where it allows women to engage in casual sex with a decreased fear of unwanted pregnancy was not what Sanger was advocating for. It was about controlling when you became a mother, not allowing you to continue to have a sexual existence and never become a mother. Now Sanger definitely advocates in the book for certain women to essentially not ever have children if they have certain health conditions or if they're feeble-minded or otherwise mentally ill or physically disabled. But for her, there is something in the feminine spirit that is tied to being a mother. Something else that Sanger talks a lot about is that the working classes need knowledge of birth control. She thought that women workers had a moral obligation to stop having children until society valued her offspring and put a higher value on motherhood. She uses rhetorical questions like, quote, shall she not sacrifice her mother instincts for the common good? Until the world is made for children to live in, she will have no children at all. On the topic of hormonal contraceptives, I personally had a very bad experience with hormonal contraceptives after using them for nine years, starting when I was 19. And I might make a video about it at some point because it's a topic that's very close to my heart. While I'm a libertarian and I support that technology being available and women being able to use it, I think that the best thing is for women to have the most information that they can to make their decision. Sanger was a huge supporter of the birth control pill when it was developed, but she died in 1966, shortly after birth control was legalized in the US. So I would be very interested to know what she would think as a nurse and someone who is in charge of women's health of everything we have learned about the long-term effects of hormonal contraceptives, both in terms of direct health effects like increased risk of blood clots, mood swings, mental health effects, vitamin deficiencies, depleted gut microbiome, and increased susceptibility to infections, including STDs, just to name a few, as well as the effect on mate choice, because she makes a big point about discussing mate choice. Because the research is showing that the usage of hormonal contraceptives interferes with the mates that women would choose naturally. So we really have no idea how this is all affecting the way that societies are developing and how it might be impacting the increase in happiness of women over time, even as in the Western world, they have more rights and privileges than ever before. What I think she is talking about with this feminine spirit is this like inner knowing and intuition and nurturing. And the feminine spirit, if you're calling it that, is disrupted by the hormonal contraceptive pill. You lose touch with your cycles. You lose touch with the fluctuations in your mood and your energy levels. You don't ovulate. And I could go on for a whole video about hormonal contraceptives and why I'm so against them. So maybe I'll make a video in the future about that. But I do support the use of barrier methods for birth control. I'm a sex positive person. I have a very socially liberal view of sex. I think that casual sex is perfectly fine if you can handle it. But I don't think most women can psychologically handle it. If you can, have at it. I just don't think most women are cut out for it. I am one of those women who can handle it, but I am very much an exception, not the rule. Now, when I say casual sex, I don't mean demeaning, dehumanizing sex. I mean sex with someone you respect and that you treat like a human being and who treats you like a human being, but you're not in a committed relationship with them. I think what's important is for women to define what their boundaries are and learn to assert those boundaries. So if they want something specific from a partner, they need to ask for it. And if they don't get it, then they need to be willing to walk away. Most women are not good at that and they're not willing to do it. I also think it's important, even if you do enter into a committed relationship, to be able to have a sexual relationship with that person, but not yet put yourself at risk of having a child. That you should be able to develop that relationship before you can determine if they're the kind of person that you want to have a child with, and also that you are prepared to financially provide for that child, which is something that Sanger advocates for very strongly in her book. Now, there are some things I'd like to research further, such as some health claims Sanger makes, like that women that do physical labor labor, women who walk a lot, stand for long periods of time, or use the sewing machine a lot, develop a low uterus, like their uterus hangs down. So they get pregnant more easily because it's easier for sperm to get into the womb. I'd also like to look into what the child mortality rates are now and the rates of women dying in childbirth, because I keep reading articles about how there are way too many women dying in childbirth in the US compared to how developed we are as a country. And I've never been able to really find out why, other than I think we have a lot of issues with hospital deaths and errors, but this was a big point for Sanger at the time. So I would be interested to research it further. On a final random note, I recently watched a bunch of war movies and I want to make a video someday about wars as this fundamentally masculine experience. But there are feminists who essentially will say, yeah, war is hard for men, but it's harder for women, which is exactly what Sanger says in this book. She says that the burden and horrors of the war are heaviest upon women because, quote, her heart is hardest run when the husband or son comes home to be buried or to live a shattered wreck. Plus, she has to work in the war industries as well. 
well. It's like, yeah, okay, war sucks for men, but it sucks worse for women because they have to deal with the man dying or coming back with PTSD. They have no risk of dying or developing PTSD, but you know, they have to deal with that happening to their men. So QED, clearly worse for women. Thanks for that. Margaret Sanger. Good to know that even in 1920, feminists could find a way to make men's issues about them. So that's it for this video. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. And I hope to have more content for you very soon.